One of the most uh, interesting and to me gratifying things about The Omnivore's Dilemma was that here was a book um, that people had two very different reactions to on the question of meeting me. Um, I kept hearing from people who read that book and said, well, that's it, I'm off meat. What you told me about how industrial meat production is done, I can't abide. Uh, so the book created a certain number of vegetarians. I don't know how long they're going, but you know, they told me that. And then I also heard from people who had been vegetarians. And they read that book and said, I'm going to start eating meat. <laughs> because you introduced me to a kind of agriculture I didn't know existed that is so beautiful that I want to support it. So in the end, it was kind of a wash, probably. <laughs> but that's great. See, so, so people could take the same book, the same information, and run it through a different algorithm, depending on where they started at, and come out in a very different place. And, and that's what I want to see happen in my work. I'm convinced, and maybe this is naive, that simply giving people good information about their food, their diet, the science of it, politics of it, the origin of it, um, they will make more thoughtful choices. I don't care what those choices are, they're going to be better than eating thoughts. Because that's what's gotten us into trouble. Eating without knowing, eating without a thought. Um, and uh, so I, I do think people will make the right decisions. And I know that's kind of a naive journalist idea. Uh, but, I, but it seems to work. Last question. Uh, are you going to wait for how long? Six weeks? Well, not quite. Um, I, I had a week at home, but I've been on the road for six weeks now. When you go home, do you go into your kitchen? What do you want to make? Oh, God. First thing. Well, I'll tell you what I did when I did have that week off in the middle. Um, I went to the farmer's market. We have a farmer's market on Thursdays that's walking distance from my house. And there's someone there selling fish. And one of the, the, the little good news stories is that the salmon fishery in uh, Northern California, which was closed for you know, three or four years, population crash. The salmon had come back strong enough that they had opened the season. It was only going to be open for six weeks. So I got salmon, wild salmon. Um, and I uh, grilled it. Um, really simple. And I went to my garden and I, and I got a bunch of different greens. I have collards, I have, uh, uh, I had some spinach, I had some chard, I had some kale. And I put them all in a blender and added some yogurt and some herbs and made a green sauce. And so I served that on top of the grilled fish. It was so good. And I have to tell you, it took like 15 minutes. So that was, and I look forward, I'm, I'm hoping that the salmon are still running. And that's what I'll do in the morning. Oh, the uh, Monsanto Protection Act, as it's been called. <laughs> yeah, this is, Monsanto's been trying to uh, slip things into the various farm bills that are in, uh, being considered that would basically indemnify them against being sued for anything, anytime. Um, and uh, it also undermine the authority of the Department of Agriculture or the EPA to regulate what they do. It's kind of an outrageous power grab. Um, it's now visible to everyone. And none of these farm bills has yet gone through completely. So I'm hoping that the public outcry has been uh, substantial enough that it'll get stripped out. But it's something we have to watch really carefully because once they get into conference committee, if they ever do, that's when people really can slip things in and it's too late to do anything about it. So if you care about this, it's an issue to track. And there's a very good group called Food Democracy Now. And if you sign up for their email alerts, they'll tell you when something is happening under cover of dark darkness and we can still weigh in and do something about it. But Monsanto always needs to be watched uh, like a hawk. I mean, they are very clever. They have enormous, they have tentacles throughout the entire government, even the White House. And um, uh, so keep an eye on the Monsanto Protection Act. That's a somewhat tendentious name for what it really is, but it's pretty accurate. Uh, you mentioned that, the, um, that big industry is, is terrified of this movement that doesn't yet have a name and that they are discrediting to the best of their ability this whole thing. Can you give us other examples um, what the industry is doing in order to discredit? You, you gave us the example of the, of the photojournalists. You know, yeah. like that. Do you have other examples of things for us to watch for? Well, um, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of uh, research coming out to discredit local agriculture. Um, uh, and you see
see these studies that say, well, actually, New Zealand lamb has a lighter carbon footprint than English lamb here in England. And, um, you know, it, that's interesting. And, and uh, you can always cherry pick examples. And um, I don't know exactly who prepared this research. It may have been the New Zealand Lamb Council. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know this for a fact. Um, but, what but you have to look carefully. So, you know, the use of, of research to uh, confuse issues, which we've seen, of course, with climate change. Um, we're seeing with things like global agriculture. Now, the way you do that is the New Zealand lamb, in your example, is completely grass-fed and grass-finished. Very low carbon footprint. It comes on a boat, which also has, for moving food around, the lowest carbon footprint. And then they somehow found a feedlot lamb in England to compare it to that was eating grain, which has a very high carbon footprint. But you can find lots of lamb. I was in Wales, actually, the, last, uh, the other day. And there's plenty of lamb that's never gotten grain. Um, so, so be aware of the research agenda, various research studies coming out, uh, on nutrition also, um, uh, on processed food, things like that. Um, the other thing I've noticed is that um, when I go speak, when I get an invitation to speak at an agricultural college or university, there are often organized protests. Um, I spoke at, uh, and I had three in the, in the course of a year since I was last here, where an invitation was rescinded in one case, um, and in another case, what was supposed to be a speech was turned into a debate. Uh, and they brought in some, some people from industry to debate. And it came out that, uh, what, this was at Cal Poly. I'm happy to mention, to embarrass these universities uh, anywhere I go. And Cal Poly is a big ex in uh, California. And I was invited to give a speech. And, um, and then suddenly a donor, who I know who it was, the Harris Ranch feedlot, uh, which is if you've ever driven on 55 in California, it's one of the few feedlots that's publicly open to see because it's right on the highway. It's just a, amazing. You smell it three miles before you get there. And um, the owner of that, Mr. Harris, uh, who was a big donor to the university, wrote a letter to the president saying, you know, if you let Michael Pollan speak without being answered, um, we're going to withdraw our $500,000 or $50,000 donation for this animal science center. Somehow this letter got into the hands of the LA Times and they published it. And uh, it was very embarrassing. To, but you know, what had been a speech was turned into a debate, uh, which I'm happy to do, but you know, that wasn't the plan. And then there was there was one in Washington State, at Washington State University, and there was another in Texas, uh, where I was given the president's lecture and, and some donors to their ex will complain. And so the president didn't show up at the president's lecture. <laughs> and this is when I get after dinner, instead of the nice dinner with the president and the people at the university, uh, my minder dropped me off in front of the Chipotle. <laughs> <laughs> Which I was happy with. I mean, the dinner with the president was going to be really awkward. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so there are many things uh, going on. I mean, I didn't just talk about myself. A lot of people have, have come under their uh, uh, scrutiny. And, and whenever I publish something on, you know, take the name of high fructose corn syrup in vain, I get a pile of paper from the Corn Refiners Association this thick about the science that it's the same as sugar. Um, wonderful. So it was uh, in the news today that a, a supermarket in the United States uses infrared cameras to better track where people are so they can sell more food inside their, their supermarket. When does uh, regular food get its own high-tech, science ways of trying to promote selling food? And what might that look like? That's a great question. Um, you know, the supermarket is an amazing landscape. It, and it's a treacherous landscape. And, um, you know, I was talking to somebody earlier who was telling me, you know, going on about Bloomberg's effort to shrink the, the, the uh, size of the soda cups in New York. What an outrage this was. Um, he said he wanted people to merely pause between their, six, their first 16 ounces of Social engineering. But we are the victims of social engineering every time we step foot in the supermarket. That's just another example. Um, you know, the, the, the most, uh, the sweetest, most chocolatey cereal is always at eye level, in the cereal aisle. The simple oats are at your feet. That's social engineering. Why doesn't that operate us? Um, because corporations do that. Uh, it's not being done in the public interest. Um, 
So it would be very interesting. Michael Moss talks about this in his book, uh, Sugar, Salt, and Fat. Um, I forget the order of the three things, but um, it's a terrific book. Um, and I, I urge you to read it. But he talks about, well, what if you brought the same marketing skill to baby carrots that we now bring to, you know, cocoa puffs? Or, um, uh, and you really marketed the prototype. You could sell a ton of it, but the food processors would not benefit. Um, and that's the problem. The retailers, I think, could do things. The retailers can make money on anything in the store. They actually make good money on the produce. And here's an example of something that I think speaks to your point. How would you social engineer to sell more produce? Well, a uh, graduate student did a really cool experiment at Arizona State University uh, a year or two ago. Um, he was a student of a, a, a brilliant guy named Barry Watson, who wrote a great book called Mindless Eating. It's all about how environmental cues shape our eating. And he's the one I described in Indefensive Defense of Foods, a uh, wonderful experiment where he set up some college students with two bowls of soup, yeah. and one of them refilled automatically from the bottom to see how the form people would eat. If it never, they never got to the bottom, end. it's a lot. <laughs> and if you ask them what they thought of the soup, the one that revealed they said it was particularly hearty. <laughs> anyway, his graduate student did this really cool experiment uh, at the supermarket chain in Arizona, where they designed a new shopping cart, and it had a divider halfway across with a little sign uh, across the bar at the top that said, all produce to the you know, north of this line. And um, this had a very interesting effect. First, it protected the produce from getting damaged, which is a great idea. And I don't know why we don't have that. I mean, every supermarket is set up so you go to the produce aisle first, the most delicate stuff, and then you pile on boxes of detergent. It doesn't make any sense. Anyway, there's a reason the produce is open. But the other thing that happened, though, is he was th that this cart suggested the norm was to have half produce in a cart. And people bought 40, 30 or 40 percent more produce using these carts. So we are, in the same way portion size determines how much we eat, the design of the shopping carts determines how much produce we buy. So I think, you know, Walmart should try this. I actually told them about it. Um, I say, if you want to sell more produce, try this kind of cart. And they were kind of interested in it. So we'll see. Um, so I think if we could bring the same ingenuity to the produce aisle, the problem is, again, the people selling produce don't have the dough. Uh, that's why you don't see health claims in the produce aisle. They, they can't get the money together to commission the fancy science to tell you what we already know, which is broccoli is better for you than cocoa puffs. Um, <laughs> but you will find the health claim on the cocoa puffs, you know, whole range of business. Um, <laughs> and the broccoli is sitting 